Today, I want to talk about this and it's very, very simple message. And the message is God's victory is my victory. Okay? Let's do let, repeat after it. God's victory, God's victory is my victory. One more time. God's victory is my victory. Once you embrace the story of God, once you embrace the victory of God, thank you. I knew somebody would repeat after that. <laughs> once you embrace that, once you embrace God's victory, that victory is yours. That victory is yours. The problem is, when the tension arises in our lives, we tend to think that this fight is ours. This fight is mine. And we don't like losing. So we're coming up with, we're coming up with all this strength, and we're coming up with all this strategy, all these emotions to demonize people who disagree with us. But that's what Satan wants. This fight is not your fight or my fight. This fight is God's fight. We've been hearing a lot of news this week. First one, I heard the news, uh, what's been happening in Ethiopia. Uh, there's some unfortunate stories of civil war happening there. And we have some families from Ethiopia. We, we pray for you. That's uh, it's always hard to hear news like that. We hear news from Haiti. How many of you heard the news from Haiti about the earthquakes and many people lost their lives and uh, they need desperate help? I heard Adra is actively working with the people in Haiti. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing. But all these news is, are basically overshadowed by this one phenomenon happening in the Middle East. What, what's it? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And um, what a surprise. We are a des you know, desperate attempt to escape. Very sad news. The evacuation of Afghanistan. I'm not here to really evaluate or assess what happened. That's not my job. But one thing is for sure that our hearts are broken when we see the suffering of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. U.S. Representative Mike Rogers, of course, politicians wants to make some political statements when things like that happen. And he said, we're watching President Biden's Saigon moment unfold before us. Have you heard this news? Like people are trying to com compare what's been happening in Afghanistan to what had happened in Vietnam. We hear the stories of chaos, people feeling betrayed, fear, death, of course. At the same time, it seems like Taliban is promoting that finally we have freedom, independence, and amnesty, like we forgive everyone, we can move on. And many people are wondering, is there something that we can really believe and trust? Uh, one, once the news broke out that the President Biden uh, will send more troops to Kabul to help the evacuation, and many of them will be involved in you know, evacuation with the airplane, because in our congregation we have several members who are in the military and serving as a reserve, especially in the Air Force. And I was, I, you know, I was like, whoa. I mean, we pray for you. I pray for you, Cass. Um, we definitely pray for our members who are in the service. But as I was watching this news, my question was, well, who's winning in this game? 
Who's losing? And that definitely, that's the question of a lot of media, right? Like, who's winning this? The Taliban is advanced, like, within 11 days, and the U.S. is losing the ground. And people try to make this as a news. It could be, that's the fact. But that was pictured, depicted as this is what really is. This is what really matters. And since that, what was happening in Kabul and Afghanistan was compared to what was happening, I, I just don't know anyone, I mean, in my circle, I don't have anyone is from Afghanistan. So I just don't know. But since that was compared to uh, what happened in Vietnam, and please show us some pictures on the screen that we should have some pictures available. Do you guys remember those pictures? You've probably seen it in the history books. What were you guys doing in 1975? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, these are the pictures what was happening when the evacuation happened in Vietnam. And among us, among our brothers and sisters, we have someone who were in the group of people who were evacuated in the very last group of people who came out from Vietnam. So I'd like to invite Anthony can you come forward? He looks like he's in, in his 20s, <laughs> but he was there. <laughs> uh, this is microphone number one, test, test, mic test, one. So we had a good talk, and we, we share the same last name, Lee. <laughs> and he's uh, originally from Vietnam, and he shared with me some of the stories uh, evacuating from Vietnam. So just, just like we, we have those pictures are going. Can you, can you give us some kind of description of what, what was the very last moment when you guys are going through? How old were you when that happened? Uh, I was 14 years old during that time. It's 14 years old. So you can kind of calculate how old is he right now. Uh, <laughs> but anyways... Um, so what was it like, like when, when you were in part of that, in a situation like that, you know, what was it like, like, what, 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 can you just describe it briefly, what was going on? Well, during, um, uh, April of, uh, April 4 of 1975, I was there and I was saw all of this in my own eye, and pretty much as I let you know that it was so, you know, we have a ticket to go in. To go the, into the embassy? To the embassy. Okay. But they didn't tell us, we got you a ticket to go in. It doesn't matter. Either you go in, you can get an airplane or not. Also, there's a ticket so, available for you to go into the embassy, yep. but not doesn't guarantee. Does it not guarantee? You will be airlifted to the the naval ships. Right? But most, you know, when they told us about about the ticket, is one family get one ticket, but we not can guarantee you where you gonna be, and you can get in the airplane or not. My family thought. Everybody thought. We got in the American embassy. It means that we will be heading to the airplane to go to your country. So, you know, and pretty much as I know that when we got in, it's thousands and thousands of people. Mm. And my mom, she looked at everybody. She said, how we going to get to that airplane? Some of them, you saw, that's as we were standing right there. We were standing on this corner, is two helicopters coming down. Two buildings, you saw some of the helicopter was laying, uh, laying on the building. And people inside the building to climb up to that helicopter. Before we go into the more kind of vivid scene of what was happening, what was going through in your mind 
when you are in that moment of fear, chaos, you're not, not really guaranteeing what's going to happen. What was going through in your mind, your emotion? My emotion is I didn't want to leave my country. You know, we know that uh, we need to go somewhere, we have to start everything at the beginning. We get nervous, we don't know where we need to be, or we need to be in the street, or we need to be inside, you know, some kind of shelter. We don't know, that's why we're so nervous about it. We, we don't know, we, we need to go to come to your country, and we need, what we need to do? How we need to start, you know, how, where we need to work, where we need to live? So that's why we were so afraid. Mm. And in my mind, they say, oh, please, don't let us go away. Mm. You know, to let us stay back. Because of what did my father do in Vietnam? He was the head of the commando during 1964 when they bombed Hanoi. So he will be the first one they're looking for. So for us, it's so afraid that my dad, he put on a bomb shelter that we, in February of 75, we don't sleep in a bed. We sleep underneath the shelter, bomb shelter, for two months until we, uh, they give us a ticket. Mm. But my dad, he was planning, I'm going to give you you know, pretty, pretty much as my father give, put a bomb underneath the shelter. He say, if the communists coming in, we need to push this button. We need to die together. And this is what, what my mom asking. Why do you want to do that? When you have a future, future for the kid, why are you doing this? So why don't you talk to your friend from the embassy, maybe to get us out? And that's when my father talked to at the American embassy. Mm -hmm. That's why we know we have a ticket to go to the, uh, to the embassy. So, so you mentioned about your parents and like your father and your mother, your family finally had the ticket to go into the embassy. And as you described that you guys went in, that there were thousands of people there, and knowing that the ticket would not guarantee you get out of the country, in the moment of fear and chaos, like how did your, I mean, that was very impressive uh, record that I heard from you. Like how did your mother responded and reacted in the moment like that? In the moment like that, this is what my mom did. She went, in, she went and looked at everybody and she almost teared. She go, no way, because when at 5.45, no, 4.45, they announced we got only seven airplanes left, seven helicopters. So they only have seven more seven helicopters more will come in. Coming and in, it. and that's it. At six o'clock, all the evacuation is gonna be done. And my mom looked around, and she saw thousands of people was eating, drinking, and waiting for the airplane, uh, waiting for the helicopter. Most of these people don't know that it's soon, um, you know, at six o'clock, American to be pulled out. So what did my mom did? She was kneeled down. and raise her hand. She prayed. She go, what she did to us, she tied all of us up, look like a handcuff. And she just prayed. She go, God, please help us. Show us a new place to start our new life. We are your children. Suddenly, everybody was behind us. It's about like, 20 to 15 family. We was laying, we was kneel down and raise our hand and hold each other hand. And this is what we say. Please, we are your family. God, please help us so we can start our new life. 
Most people, they were spitting on us. They stole, throw stuff at us because they think, oh, these people are crazy. You know what? In all those people that praying, when the helicopter was landing down, we all got lifted up. And all that family, because we sit there and pray, and you don't know how is God is so good to us. And so, this us up. Yeah, so like, it's been like 45, 46 years. It's 46 years. Now you're looking back in that moment. Now you are here in 2021. Like, what are your reflections on that experience? I mean, y- you need to talk to him. You just invite him over. Let him talk. <laughs> You will hear stories over and over for several hours of all this is happening, but we don't have time for that. But what are your reflections, especially? Because I was so impressed when I was hearing this story that his mother's prayer and people join with the prayer come together, right? And what are your reflections on that? Like your mother's prayer, that moment of fear and chaos. Like what, what, what's, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, on my thoughts right now, I'm going to tell you, if you don't have God in your heart, you don't have no way to turn to. So it's pretty much as at the end of Pastor sermon, I'm going to show you what is, should be done and what it should be, you know, what I'm going to do for you, for everybody in this church here. Just wait until the end of the sermon, and I'm going to show you. And thank you, Pastor Sean, to let me come up here and talk. Thank you. Thank you. You can have the microphone. (laughs) We'll have you back later. Uh, You can can have it back. That's the real story. Okay? That's the real story. In the reality of war, in the reality of challenges, in the reality of evil, and in the midst of that, we see the reality of God. What really matters is, to me, as I was hearing and as I was seeing what's happening in Kabul, Afghanistan, in the chaotic moment, that his mother's prayer, it mattered. And I believe that God heard her prayer. He was listening to her prayer. She claimed the presence of God and the peace. To me, it doesn't really matter who won that war in Vietnam. It doesn't really matter who really controls over it. To me, What really matters is when this story of our suffering and the story of the reality of the war and the pain and sorrow, when they met and clashed together with the reality of God. And when we turn our face, when we cling God with our faith, that's what it matters the most. Okay? And that's, I mean, I've been talking about really big things like the Vietnam War or war in Afghanistan. But just think about your personal life. I hope you don't have anything chaotic in your life. I hope you don't have any challenges in your life. And in reality is what? We, we do have those, Right? We do have these stories of chaos and confusion and the pain and suffering. But what it really matters is it's not you win the battle, but what it really matters is that you cling to the promise of God. Let His victory be yours. Let His victory be yours. 
It's not about fighting between U.S. and the, the Vietnamese soldiers. It's not fight between the U.S. allies or Taliban. This is, according to the Bible, and as we go towards the end, the last days, that we will see things like this more and more and more. But one, one, what we have to realize is this is, in a big picture, this is God's fight. This is not your and your and your fight. Sometimes we're so confused that I have to win this argument. I have to win this opinion. I have to make everyone to believe what I believe. And we sometimes easily turn someone into the category of enemy. Let's think about Israel, Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, in the time of Daniel. Okay? The kingdom, city of Jerusalem, was destroyed by Babylonian soldiers. Do you remember the story? Daniel chapter 1. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylonian soldiers. King Nebuchadnezzar came. It looks like the fight was between Jerusalem and Babylon. But we all know the story. This is not about Jerusalem and Babylon, right? Who was winning was totally meaningless. God was in control. And the, and the victor, and the person, I mean, it's not about Babylon winning the game. It's not about Israel losing the game. What we really have to believe from that story is God is victorious at the end. Amen? I mean, there are many examples that I can show you because Satan wants us to be confused and try to, like, pushing us and poke us to think that this is our fight, that I have to win this game and this fight. But just let's go to book of Luke. Book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, in Jesus' ministry, there are many times the demon-possessed people came to Jesus. And they were asking. Well, sometimes they even didn't, didn't ask anything. But what we know for sure is the people who are demon-possessed are going through suffering. Are we, can we all agree upon this? Like people who are going through the de going through this time that they were possessed by these demons, unclean spirits, they are going through sufferings. And here is the presence of Christ. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 31. Then he went, Jesus, he went down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and was teaching them on Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice. Can you imagine that he was in the church and he was teaching lessons. And now this presence of Jesus Christ proclaiming the message. And in that synagogue there was a person who were totally possessed, and he had this spirit. And, and I don't have time to explain all this demon possess, possession, but one thing that I can tell you is this. We talked about image of God for many, many times. We are all created as image bearer, right? But what demon possess means that you are basically bearing the image of the devil. Okay? The, so it's a kind of devil trying to manipulate this work of creation. But anyways, here is this man sitting there in the synagogue. And verse 34, it says, demon, this unclean spirit talking. Okay? Unclean spirit talking. This is not that man. This is unclean spirit talking. Verse 34, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of 
God. The Holy One of God. So here we see this man sitting like in the synagogue was totally possessed by the demon. Here we have Son of God, Jesus Christ. Here is this man suffering. This unclean spirit, of course, is not from God. It's from Satan. Right? What was this man doing in this fight, in this picture? He could not say anything. He could not do anything. What he was in was he was just going through the suffering. It was, and, and just see the reaction of this unclean spirit. It says like, you are, what do I have to do with you? You are here to destroy me. You're not going to talk to your friends, friendly friends saying that you are going to destroy me, right? The demon, the unclean spirit was afraid. An unclean spirit was saying that you are going to destroy us. This is the fight between God, ultimate good, and the ultimate evil. And this man in between, he did not have anything to do, anything to speak. He was totally helpless. What he needed was to cling in his faith. So that the Son of God can restore him. Was this his fight? Was this the fight between ultimate good and ultimate evil? Which one is it? Which one is it? We are going through sufferings in our lives. And what Jesus and his story is all about, restoring life, bringing us back to the reality of God, the story of God. What Satan does, since we, after sin, we have this knowledge of good and evil, what Satan does is, hey, come this side. This is the reality. And when we are following the reality of Satan, that's what is going to happen, that you will be possessed by this demon. And the end of that route is what? The wages of sin is death. Do you see this fight right now? We sometimes, we're so confused and we're so into this small fight, political fight, or some kind of military conflict, territorial conflict, cultural conflict, that we just try to think that this is my fight, that I'm going to fight this to the end of my life. And you are just give everything all into this. But the reality is, and the Bible tells us, there's a bigger picture going. Another example that I want to find is this. In, we, we read it from 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 18, the story of David, right? Story of David. We all love this story, right? David and... Oh, yeah, we have an audience listening. David and Goliath. Uh, it's chapter 17, actually. The David and Goliath story, like we see, I, I assume you all know this story really well. I'm not going to go through all the details of the story. But what, what we see on the surface is there's a conflict between Israel and the Philistine, right? The Israel and Philistine. And also, if, if we read more of this story, we see this fight is going into what? Fight between David and Goliath, right? But David did not see this as his own personal fight. I mean, of course, he had that skill, slingshot, but he didn't see it as his own personal fight. If you go to chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, it says, that David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. You, you come with all these all this gears that you can have. 
Seems like this is your fight, physical fight, wrestling. This is your fight like that. But, but I come to you. David said what? But I come to you, what? In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David totally see the situation that this is a spiritual fight. This is not his own fight. What King Saul misunderstood was he thought that was David's fight. And that's why he was jealous. But this was not David's fight. It was God's fight. And what David did was he was simply cling on the promise of God. And he said, you know what? This is, Lord, this is not, fight, not my fight. And that's why in verse 47, verse 47 for the scripture reading we read, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. And it says what? For the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. We tend to think all these fights, all these tensions around us are our fight. And we do not want to lose those fights and we put our hearts and our minds and our strength. But what we realize is we cannot win this fight. Because this fight is not about I win the argument, I win the battle. All the fight that we have in this earth is a part of the great conflict between the ultimate good and ultimate evil. Paul grasps this picture really well in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we have this story of wearing the armor of God. Do you remember the story? Wearing the armor of God. Actually, I have an armor. I just didn't bring it. Um, but in that story, what we find here in chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the will of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh. Many times that we try to think that we want to wrestle against our brothers and sisters. That's the way to win. But Paul is saying that we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of the wickedness in heavenly places. This is not about my culture and your culture. This is not about your political view and my political view. And sometimes we're so into that fight, trying to demonize our brothers and sisters. No. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57 says this. We all know this verse really well. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to be God, in verse 57, but thanks to be God who gives us the victory. Who gives us the victory? God gives us victory. It's not your strategy. It's not your eloquent speech about certain issues. Victory comes from who? From God. Thanks to be God, thanks to be God, who gives us the victory, but it's not just a big picture of victory. Thanks to be God gives us the victory through, okay? Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we have to lift up Jesus in our lives. That's the reason why we have to lift up Jesus in our ministries. 
The victory comes through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is, He is our story, and He is our value, and He is our right, and Jesus is our hope, and Jesus is our strength, and Jesus is our our advocate, and Jesus is our mediator, and Jesus is our general, and Jesus is the solution, and Jesus is the Savior. And we become victorious when you and I embrace Him, when you and I have faith in Jesus Christ. Adventist. Maybe you may be asking, like, Pastor, why like, aren't we the one who have to preach about the second coming of Christ? What do we do with this? The message that we heard. I think we have this responsibility to tell the world that the second coming is something that we have to focus on. Not the things that's happening here that just think that that's the end of story. We all have to focus on our eyes to His coming. All of us, we have to share this story, whether they are Christians or not. Whether they are conservatives or liberals. Whether they are Republicans or Democrats. Whether they are true Americans or not true Americans. We have to tell all of them that doesn't really matter. What matters the most is to have Jesus in our lives. Capitalism, it couldn't fix the human selfishness. Socialism couldn't fix human greediness. Western culture, Eastern culture, Asian culture, African culture, Hispanic culture, none of those cultures could not fix the human problems. Even religions could not fix those problems. But what we do, the Seventh-day Adventists, or follower of Christ, this is not about the system. What we do, is we're having this movement to telling people, don't just zero into one historical incident and that that will make things change. Don't think that my conflict, my fight is everything. What we have to do is we have to broaden our perspective, telling people that there is a greater fight of, between the ultimate good and ultimate evil. The, four, the few things I want to mention as I close my sermon. I took my kids to Taekwondo place. Do you guys know what Taekwondo is? It's a martial arts. And I want them to learn. Maybe I will learn something. And the master in that place, he, the studio, he was telling my kids, there are three things that is very important. First one is, by the way, Charity does Taekwondo too, right? So, show her respect. <laughs> what, 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 what the master told us is this, first, eye focus. You have to eye focus when you... Second, Mind focus. Third, body focus. And I've been using it a lot, like my kids, whenever we eat, if they want to go somewhere, I say, hey, eye focus, eat. <laughs> Mind focus, don't go anywhere. Body focus, sit straight. But as I'm thinking about it, there's some spiritual aspect in that. And I'm not telling you you have to take Taekwondo. That's not what I meant. But what I'm saying is as we live our lives surrounded by these tensions and conflicts, I think it's really, really important for us to have this eye focus 
on God. We can find in Psalms 121. It says what? I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Your help comes from the Lord. Our eyes should be focused on God. It's not like there's one conflict, one issue that I really want to focus. That, that focus, our eyes must be centralized. That We have to look at His values, His words, so that we can tune into Him. As I was, I was thinking about mind focus, Philippians chapter, chapter 3. We all know this chapter really well. Philippians chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses from 20. It says that, you know what? Paul was not saying, you know, Paul was a proud Roman citizen. You all know that. But he said, no, 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 that's not the my focus. He said in verse 20, he says, for our citizenship is in where? Our citizenship is in heaven, for, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's the focus that we need to have. Body focus, what does that mean? We can go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. I know I used to read all these verses, but I want you to find chapter 3, verses from 10 to 13. It says this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with the fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in will be burned up. Therefore, since all this will be, things will be deserved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? If we have our focus on Christ, if we have our focus, our eyes fixed on Christ, what kind of life that we should be living? There's one encouragement that I have. And I would like to have Anthony to come up. The story that he shared with us in that chaotic moment in American embassy, they're waiting for the out. The moment of fear, moment of confusion. What his mother did was what? She was focused. She was totally focused on Jesus by bringing everyone come closer in that very moment of fear and bringing the presence of God in there. Anything you want to share? Some of what you wanted to say? Yes. Uh, this one I would like to, can I have everybody stand up, please? And walk toward the altar. If you can, if, you can, if you're feeling comfortable, here. please come forward. Please come forward. Please come forward. We have plenty of space. You can come from, you can come from the behind. What I do in here is I show you we are a family of God. We are inside this house of God. And you know, sometimes I'm coming here and I see each people just kind of scattered all over. Now, I want everybody to come forward and I'm going to have Pastor Sean is going to pray for us and show God we are one family. We are the family of God and you all have God in your heart. So that's why I do this to show you that we are the family. We pray for each other. We pray for people around the world. No matter, I don't care they black, they white, they Asian, but we here 
so we can pray for them. Just remember the his story. I, the one thing that I touched so hard is it could be a moment like this that we all want, wanted to be lifted up by helicopter to get out of that moment. And that moment, there was a one strong lady standing up, lead people into focus on Christ by praying. So as we, I mean, this just reminds me the moment like that, what kind of feelings that they had. And this moment, I want all of us to join with us singing this song. It's because we need Jesus every moment in our lives. And we have to focus on him. Do we have the lyrics? I need thee everywhere. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can be I need thee. Surrounded by this troubling news, surrounded by this tension and conflicts and violence and troubles. And many times that we think this fight is our own fight and try to come up with our own solution. And many times that if someone disagrees with that, we try to just put them and demonize them. But Lord, this moment that we realize that this fight is not our fight. This is your fight. What we need to do is with faith that we have to cling on to you. Claim your victory as ours. Lord, if we have done anything in the past, hurting someone by putting our efforts to win this battle by ourselves. Lord, please forgive us. If we push someone, if we are arguing with someone by pushing our own views, hurting someone by doing that, Lord, I just pray that you forgive us and help us to remember 
that we have to cling on to you. It's not something that I do. It's not something that I come up. It's not some kind of solution that I come up with. Lord, help us to be humbly accept your plan and your will in our lives. And Lord, help us humbly be reflecting your love to our brothers and sisters. Whether that person is non-Christian or Muslim, whether the person doesn't believe in God at all, Lord, help us to remember that we are the agents to reflect your love to that person. Lord, we know that you won that victory, that we have to have faith in you. Help us, our unbelief, and help us to grow our faith and help us to be truly the ambassador of Christ and His love to everyone. Well, here we have Southview members come together as a family. Like Anthony's family story, Lord, even in that chaotic moment, when they gathered together and prayed that Your presence was there. Lord, I just pray that we can come together like His family praying together, serve together, share your love together so that people can see you through us. We thank you, Lord, for your calling in our lives. And I pray in Jesus' name.